Dr. O'Keefe, uh, Equilibra focuses a lot on the various dangers threatening uh, human life on Earth, and life on Earth generally, um, both those coming from outside our planet and those that we have created ourselves as humanity. What, do you see the greatest, the greatest danger at the moment being from man-made threats? And if you do, what are the most serious of these? We have very serious threats to our existence that are cosmic, geological, epidemiological, and uh, anthropogenic. The geological include uh, meteorites, comets, electromagnetic pulses, gamma rays, solar radiation, among others. The geological threats include uh, super volcanoes that could spew out enough material to cause uh, volcanic winters. The epidemiological threats include um, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria and rapid mu rapidly mutating uh, viruses like the novo coronavirus and the, the, the sickness COVID-19 associated uh, with it. And then we have the anthropogenic threats. And they are mostly the result of our not being able to handle our own science and technology. So in 1945, one of the greatest accomplishments of science in history was achieved in splitting the atom. But it immediately became a threat to human existence since its birth, since its birth it was weaponized with uh, atomic and thermonuclear weapons that have been used, as we all know, in, on Japan and Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. That threat persists to this date there's over 4,000 nuclear warheads that are operational, ready to be launched and uh, do in humanity. Then we have climate change. As a result of the Industrial Revolution onward, our choice of fuels, of fossil fuels, that has led to immense uh, em emissions of gases greenhouse gases to the point where they can now threaten our existence if they continue unabated. Therefore, the critical necessity of limiting the increase in global warming due to the greenhouse gas effect in this century to 1.5 degrees. But there's a third category too, which has to do with uh, artificial intelligence, robots, logarithms, the Internet of Things. And scientists take this very, very seriously. This has been well portrayed by Hollywood with all the films about the revolt of the machines, the robots turning against the human beings. And some of these films are very explicit, that the robots decide that the humans are a virus destroying the planet and should be eliminated. There's been scientific conferences where people of the stature of Stephen Hawkins and others have discussed this seriously. I think the reason for that is they can't find a good argument to use against the logic of the robots about humans being a virus destroying the planet and the planet would be better off without them. So I think we should change them, our ways rather than hoping that the robots uh, come to a different uh, conclusion so that they can look at us a bit differently. But um, definitely the anthropogenic um, threats of nuclear weapons, climate change, and, uh, and our artificial intelligence are greater in probability than the, the cosmic, geological, or epidemiological, which is very real, as we know, with COVID-19. Now, that is a sad commentary on our species. It's a, a 
a species that is leading itself through uh, a masochism, a species masochism, which is leading us to a species suicide by our own science and technology. We must reverse these trends, get out of this framework in which our own science and technology is the, the greatest threat we face. But if we don't, we'll probably be done in by our own hand, our own science and technology through atomic weapons, climate change, or artificial intelligence. Some people argue, um, Dr. O'Keefe, that uh, in the current context of the COVID-19 pandemic, that the Western ruling elites that were in big trouble economically anyway are now trying, under cover of the pandemic, to reset Western capitalism, restoring levels of profitability by intensifying domestic economic subjugation and financial dependency of their own populations, while overseas they intensify a kind of neo-colonial subjugation of the rest of the planet's natural resources using what they're calling now the fourth industrial revolution. Does your book Equilibra address that argument and the argument that humanity can only save itself and the planet by ending capitalism? Prior to COVID-19, we had a situation of gross inequality in the world. One percent of the world's population controlling 62 percent of the world's uh, assets. Some of the calculations are even worse than that. This is a result of the dominant elites no longer taking into consideration redistribution. Previously, after major crises, the elites would take into account gross inequality that produced the crisis and worsened in the crisis to try to rebalance things with regard to inequality. If we go back to 1890, that was the end of a 20-year depression known as the Long Depression in the United States that affected, of course, the rest of the world as well. What was the redistribution that came out of that? In the United States, it was the Sherman Antitrust Act. It was the, uh, the breaking up of the trust, the Petroleum Trust of Rockefeller, the Steel Trust of Carnegie, the Railway Trust of Harriman. This is big time politics because these trust busters were confronting the most powerful men economically in the country, by definition, since they had these monopolies. But that took place. After the financial crisis of 1907, it took several years to put together, but the inequality coming out of that was addressed through the progressive income tax that became in 1913. Big time redistribution. An income tax that was progressive in the sense that the percentage to be charged for the tax rose with the degree of wealth, the degree of income in this case. It's an income tax. After the Great Depression that began in 1929, the redistributive element was the um, Social Security insurance huge redistribution, payroll tax, both for the employer and for the employee, redistribution of, uh, of income, redistribution of wealth to rebalance. After the crisis of 2007-2009, what happened in terms of redistribution? Zilch, nothing. Absolutely nothing. The only things that were of concern in Dodd-Frank or in Basel III of the Bank of International Settlements was to ensure the financial stability of the banks in a crisis so that the taxpayer would no longer have to bail out the banks. And what they did there also 
was an increased inequality by bailing out the banks. They could have also bailed out the mortgage holders who could have paid the banks. But they didn't, uh, that wasn't on the agenda. It was a matter of saving the banks. Once the difference between 1890, 1907, 1929, and 2007, 2009, there was no longer a fear of revolution, a no longer a fear of Bolshevism, no longer a fear of the Soviet Union, no longer a fear of socialist uh, politics, no longer a fear of labor unions. All of their backs had been broken and capital no longer feared opposition to its position. And so there has been no redistribution because there's no effective counterweight to the, to the capitalist uh, elite. I happened to be at UCLA in January 1961 as a Los Angeles school system honor student. And we got to take a course at UCLA, the honor students from East High School, so that we would get accustomed to the universities we would be heading to the next year. And I was at UCLA taking a course, and there was the commencement ceremony which I attended, and there uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who had recently left the presidency, made his famous military industrial complex speech, warning of the dangers that that posed, this military industrial complex. A large standing military and a military industrial complex that the country hadn't had before the Second World War, but now it had that, the dangers that posed for U.S. Uh, democracy. That has evolved with time. It's now the military, police, intelligence, industrial, financial complex. There's more on board but it's more powerful than ever. Some call it the deep state also. And it is very, very real, and it is the power center in, uh, in U.S. foreign policy. And uh, those who challenge it are subject to, uh, to the retribution of this powerful complex. And so um, that is a... Uh, Two factors here. With regard to capitalism, and in Ekadiba, uh, there's identification of nine alienations that are leading us to um, extinction, subjective factors. And one of them is the belief that uh, unlimited, endless, mindless growth of production, consumption, and accumulation of wealth can continually occur on a planet with degraded, declining, limited resources. And the name of that alienation is capitalism that believes that there can be endless accumulation of capital, endless accumulation of capital based on endless production and consumption and works in that direction which is leading us to extinction. And much graver, this is reinforced by a hegemonic elite based around that uh, military, police, intelligence, industrial, financial, industrial complex that now is in a stage after the collapse of the Soviet Union where the United States decided that it was hegemonic militarily across the world and its policy was to remain that way. And, and derived from that has been this uh, full spectrum domination of the world in which the domination is not only 
military, not only political, not only economic, not only social, but also with regard to uh, social media, with regard to mass media, with regard to science, with regard to technology, with regard to full spectrum. All of the spheres it wants to be dominant. And I'll close this with just one little example. The technological hegemony. The U.S. technological establishment cannot compete with China in terms of the Internet of Things, in terms of 5G. China is ahead. So instead of competing with Huawei, that is the repository of a great part of that technology, it decides to try to eliminate Huawei from the marketplace. They quite conspicuously state that they don't believe in socialism, that they want to combat socialism wherever it, it is to be found. But it would seem they don't believe in capitalism either. They believe in their own hegemony, not in uh, either socialism or capitalism. So, in, re in relation to the current context, um, some people think that uh, as, a, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it may be possible to uh, persuade people to snap out of some of these alienations. Um, and that there's a potential for a change in attitudes that may promote sufficiently positive change in people's behavior for them to contribute to perhaps reversing the negative trends that Equilibra uh, so comprehensively covers. And do you think it's possible to take advantage of this potential change in attitudes, or you do, do you think that potential opportunity is just going to slip away? There was an element left hanging from the last question that's an important element in terms of this question. In uh, the period between March and May, mid-March to end of May, uh, Jeff Bezos made $29 billion. That's the largest amount of money made by any mortal in the history of humankind. By far, $29 billion. And the same time, the same time period coming through now into June, uh, 47 million U.S. workers filed for unemployment insurance. If we had a 1% situation before this crisis, look at the uh, accentuation of inequality due to this crisis. The owners of Amazon, Walmart, all of the five uh, media companies, media oligopies, they control the Netflix and the other things that people have been doing all of these months, sitting at home, have increased their wealth enormously. Uh, and uh, Walmart increased its sales by 57 percent. So you have Amazon, Walmart. The big entities were not obliged to close down. It's the mom and pop shops that were obliged to close down. And many of those, the small merchants, will be going into, into bankruptcy. Now we come to the crux of this. Of these millions of workers, many will not find a job to come back to. Artificial intelligence has been on its way for some time now. And the golden opportunity for the capitalists is that they don't have to have, have the social problem of firing the workers, because the workers already are, are already out on unemployment insurance. So if some people will go back to their old uh, firm and find that they've been replaced by a robot, a logarithm, or uh, Internet of Things, and, and their post is no longer is no longer there. You know, some of the uh, Democratic candidates had sort of addressed this. Uh, the Democratic candidate Yang, 
as you'll recall, who comes out of the technology sector was proposing an inter uh, universal income. Why is he proposing international income out of largesse, noblesse oblige, for the, uh, for the impoverished? No, because as a tech entrepreneur, he knows the mass unemployment that's going to be produced by uh, artificial intelligence. Li, uh, who is the Chinese guru in this, and who was the president of Google China previously, he has estimated that 40% of jobs will be lost in the coming 15 years. 40% of jobs. So I think that uh, there will be more than enough material base for mobilizing people against this system which goes overboard with inequality and I think that's already part of what's happening on the street in the United States. The black unemployment rate in February was 6 percent. Coming into May it was 16 percent. That's a big shift and I'm sure it will go further but it's not going to be below the white unemployment rate, knowing how the U.S. operates. So it'll go over 25 percent. So we'll have massive unemployment. And it could be there's a factor of, 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 of cognitive uh, coming to terms with the risks we have and uh, the inequities in our society. Even in with regard to the COVID-19 deaths, we all know that uh, the deaths were largely or overrepresented, the, the, the black and Latino communities were overrepresented, the white community was underrepresented, and the Asian community was even less represented. And in some places it's very dramatic. 30% of the population in Chicago and 70% of the deaths. New Orleans was something similar. And that, of course, is a, a commentary on, on poverty on chronic uh, malnutrition, on chronic lack of uh, adequate uh, health care, of the lack of a national health system that would be equitable in health care for all, which does not exist in the, in the United States. And this is going to generate the Great Depression 2020. And the Great Depression uh, 2020 will lead to huge hardship because we not only have these jobs lost, will have all of these businesses lost that could not survive the great confinement and uh, will not be able to survive the slow economy that comes out of, of this. So it's a mix of subjective factors perhaps of people increasing their consciousness which is very visible with regard to race in the United States right now. The, the, the movement against, uh, against racism is uh, multi-ethnic and multi-class and multi-age group and so I think that things are uh, happening. You know, in, um, in equilibria we argue that uh, fundamental social change tends to come from social movements and uh, I think you, yeah. I, I think you have another question on that but I this do. is, this is uh, I think this is taking shape. So yeah, in that context how do you see the different roles that different kinds of entities have, for example, um, the nation state, which is constantly under threat, uh, ever greater threat as a result of previous trends of globalization and corporate influence, um, international institutions like the UN, which has suffered severe criticism for being so in ineffective on various issues, and then you have the role of non-governmental organizations, and something that you've emphasized, the importance of social movements, for example, in the case of the environment, in the UK, there's this big movement called Extinction Rebellion, and then you have a more, more in, on a more broad international basis, you have the movement led by Greta Thunberg. And what do you think are the respective roles of those kinds of entities in the current context? Let's look at a couple of examples. Why haven't the climate change negotiations come to real fruition in terms of leading to uh, fundamental change? In, in, in reality and on paper. 
Kyoto was a good agreement, the Protocol of Kyoto. It was legally binding. It had goals to be met by all of the other developed countries. But the United States was a signatory of Kyoto, but the U.S. Congress, U.S. Senate did not ratify it. So the United States was outside of the Protocol of Kyoto. And so the Europeans and the Japanese and others were in a panic by the United States not being in on the, in on the deal. So they put together body and the body working groups. That the body working groups were designed to get the United States in on the deal. And then it was decided that Kyoto would be replaced by another agreement and the United States began to influence what other agreement would look like. And it insisted that it be not legally binding. And so it came up with a figure that was called an agreement under the conference that would um, have the effect of law. Not even the lawyers of the United States could tell us what that meant. They were the ones who designed it, but they couldn't tell us what that meant. The only thing we knew was that it did not mean, it did not mean legally binding, because that's what it was designed to replace with, with this ambiguity. The then the United States insisted that everything be voluntary. Inside, the United States has resisted finance and the transfer of technology to developing countries. It's a resisted including loss and damages at the same level as, um, as uh, mitigation and adaptation. So the Europeans and the Latin American right, which, which after 2017 has been the group of Lima, were making concession after concession to the, to the United States. And the Paris Accord was approved according to that, with all these concessions to the United States uh, included. So you can imagine the disgust of the Europeans and the Latin American right when the Trump administration announces that the United States was retiring from the Paris Agreement that had been made to order by its, uh, its dimensions, the sizes that it uh, that it said about the neck, the length of the sleeve, and then they tore it up. So, but that's where we're at in terms of the climate change uh, negotiations. The United States is not in, and it has its allies like Australia and Brazil that are in effect taking the U.S. positions at the same time. So that has threw a spanner in the, in the negotiations. The United States has opposed, including uh, loss and damage at the same level of adaptation and mitigation. Even in the recent Madrid COP25, they were blocking the way to that, despite the fact you have Dominica, you have Barbuda, Abaco, Grand Bahama, completely wiped out, and there is no international mechanism to, to deal with that. Does that mean, in your opinion, that you think that, for example, the role of social movements is futile? No, not at all. I mean, that's the role that's left. That's the role that's left. I kind of look at uh, uh, Greta, Greta's uh, evolution. Greta first talked to national leaders thinking that they could do it. And then she put great faith in the United Nations and was uh, completely disillusion with the United Nations when she went to the UN and then to the COP25. And leaving COP25 she was saying, oh, only the people can do this. Eliminating the governments and eliminating the international organization, only people can do this. And she's right. But it's people organized in movements. Basic social change has come through people organized in movements. And it's not people from one country, it's from a whole series of countries. It's not from one sector, it's church people 
uh, labor people, women, some business people, some politicians, students from all different types of sectors. If you study the anti-slavery movement, that's what it looked like. It was in the U.S., it was in the U.K., it was in the continent, it was in different parts of the world. And the people had different methods, they had perhaps uh, differences in terms of their methods, but they had one very clear goal, abolish slavery. And then it clicked. And in July 1831, the UK Parliament abolishes slavery. And the United States, claro, after a bloody civil war, in the midst of a bloody civil war in 1964, there's the Emancipation Proclamation. You know, I think that one of the things that happens with the anti-slavery, anti-colonial, women's suffrage, labor movement, the different movements historically that have triumphed, is that they can, they can, they can be struggling for centuries, years, and all of a sudden it happens. And I think that highly associated with that is generational change. That you get to a generation that has a completely different take on the issue, that which is very obvious that slavery is a great evil and slavery has to be abolished and so it, it starts to click and it starts to fall into place. And I hope that that's the case now in the 20th century and that these youth are on the street. I was very impressed in COP25 Coming back from the Cope, Greta had had a, a manifestation, had had a, a concentration, huge one in Madrid. And I was looking at the after march, people going home with their pancarts. There was 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds with their pancarts going home. And a, you know, a slew of 16, 17 year olds. These people, at 18 in these countries will be voting and the idea of the passive complacent youth will have to be filed completely because these people will be hyperactive they have clearly are clear what they want to do and in countries where the correlation of forces is very tight them coming down on one side or another could make a big difference politically. Right. So they could acquire real political power faster than, uh, than we think. But, um, you know, Father Descoto, who influenced me very much, had a book on uh, reforming the United Nations. And he saw that that in the end was impossible because in Articles 108 and 109, there's padlocks on the United Nations because it declares that to make the change, the, the General Assembly has to be in agreement and all five members, permanent members of the uh, Security Council. And 109 says you can have a conference and that can have a majority for changing the United Nations, but it must include all five permanent members of the United Nations. So there's a veto on uh, on United Nations transformation. Mm -hmm. So in the end, Father had come to the conclusion what needs to be done is abolish it and start all over again because we'll never come out of uh, the veto power that the United States exercises in, uh, in all proposals for change. In relation to the U.S. ability to put a break on positive developments, through it via its veto in the Security Council. Um, their, their obsession with full spectrum dominance is, is, is something that you've in, insisted on and emphasized. Do you think the developing multipolar world that we're currently seeing emerge will develop sufficiently quickly to enable humanity to avoid the path to some kind of destructive conflict that is implicit in U.S. unilateralism. You said will, and that's a very, that's a very wisely chosen word, because it is not there yet. 
And an example of that was how Hillary Clinton snuck one through the Security Council with regard to Libya, in which there was a vote to protect civilians in, uh, in Libya, in eastern Libya, and then uh, France, the UK, and the United States took that, and they bombed the whole country, they bombed the Libyan army, they, they, they supported all opposition forces elsewhere, and it was, they forgot about Benghazi completely and started concentrating on Tripoli. And they, they, they uh, were managed to overthrow the government. Then it cooperated with the West, disarming its nuclear capacity. It's the one success story in undoing nuclear capacity. And it had cooperated politically and had relations with Italy and France. And that didn't matter. And the, the government was overthrown. And uh, Omar al Qaddafi was assassinated. Hillary laughed. And the country dropped into chaos and anarchy that has not emerged from yet. So that's a story of uh, how beneficial the Western regime change interventions have been for Afghanistan, Iraq. Libya, Syria, which have created uh, chaos and uh, mass killing, mass destruction, and uh, destroying countries one after another. So do you, do you think the emergence of uh, the Russian Federation, its very important strategic partnership with the People's Republic of China, their alliance with regional powers like Iran, for example, and here in Latin America, their, their, their strong support, which has so far enabled uh, the Venezuelan people and their government under President Nicolas Maduro to resist. This is essential. There has to be counterweight to the, uh, to the United States. And uh, that's one of the things that happened with the with the crumbling of the Soviet Union, the United States was left without counterweight. That's why they could invade uh, Iraq in a war of aggression on false pretense. Because there was no counterparty waiting in the world at that point in time that could, uh, that could stop them. And um, the world has paid a huge price for that. And they also do other things like the um, unilateral, coercitive, illegal measures against countries, against organizations, against individuals, which are completely illegal. But there's not the counterweight in the world to stop them right now. And the United States, Great Britain, Canada, the European Union, and most recently, Switzerland, for some reason, have joined into that imperial exercise of thinking that they are morally superior to the rest of the world, and therefore they self-appoint themselves as police, prosecutor, and judge of the rest of the world in terms of human rights and in terms of corruption when it's blatantly political, and in some cases, blatantly commercial what they're what they're doing and uh, and they get away with it because the United States has a dictatorship in the world banking system called SWIFT and the bankers of the world and many uh, enterprise people are most fearful of being excluded from that because the economic consequences of being excluded from that are enormous and it's incredible how the Europeans meekly follow the U.S. on this with regard to uh, countries like Venezuela and, and Nicaragua when um, they themselves are being subject to these sanctions like the European firms that trade with Iran. The Europeans want to keep the Iran uh, nuclear deal alive and have their firms trade. The United States places sanctions. They've invented a system to uh, go outside the U.S. sanctions. 
the U.S. wants to sell its gas to Northern Europe, to Germany, to, to the rather other Northern European countries. And so the U.S. opposes the Nord Stream pipeline from Russian Federation to, to, to Germany and says, oh, this will make Germany dependent on Soviet uh, gas. Or they say, as Trump says, he says, we're paying for their defense and they buy their gas from uh, Russia. That's not the way things should be done, Trump says. So he wants to decide German energy policy for them. What he wants is uh, LPG tankers to leave uh, Louisiana full of gas for, for Northern Europe. And so they're in the threat of uh, sanctions against the companies that work on the Nord Stream 1 uh, pipeline. So Europe is schizophrenic on this, but they show how dependent they are on the United States, even psychologically, by following the U.S. example into these coercive illegal sanctions that also affect them negatively. And talking about those sanctions, that kind of brings us to Nicaragua. They're really not sanctions. I misspoke. Sorry. They're, they're illegal measures. The only thing that should be called sanction are those approved by the UN Security Council, which are the only ones that are legal. These have no basis in international law and in, in, in any basis in any law whatsoever because the whole idea that countries can uh, have a transnational application of their law, like the United States claims, is completely illegal also. Extraterritoriality does not exist in international law. And yet it's doubly bad in terms of the United States because it claims extraterritoriality for its law but doesn't accept international law in the United States. So there's that duality as well. So countries like Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela have been subject to these coercitive sanctions, coercive sanctions, these illegal, uh, these Ill illegal measures. Um, and but for, do, do you think that is some kind of indication of how Nicaragua is kind of, as it were, punching above its weight in the world? And why should it be the object of these sanctions? And do you think it's able that, do you think Nicaragua being able to work with Russia or China or the non-aligned movement, um, or regionally with SICA, the Association of Caribbean States and ALBA, do you think Nicaragua's role in these international cooperation instances uh, uh, it will enable it to play a positive role, perhaps the same kind of inspirational role that it had for many people around the world in the 1980s? Well, I think that uh, Nicaragua plays an inspirational role for the rest of the world right now. If you look at Nicaragua's uh, special role, punching above its weight, in terms of all the climate change negotiations and all the things that Nicaragua has done with regard to, to climate change. Nicaragua's role in uh, reducing poverty and inequality within Nicaragua with redistributive policies like universal free health and education in the second poorest country in Latin America and the Caribbean. Any Nicaraguan can go to a public hospital and get attention. Any Nicaraguan can go to a public hospital and have an operation, have uh, serious diagnostics undertaken by state-of-the-art equipment, and there's no bill. And you know, the United States hasn't been able to put a system together on which there's consensus with regard to having a public health system in the United States. Nicaragua is light years ahead of the United States. It's not presumptuous to say at all that the uh, U.S. could learn a lot from Nicaragua in terms of uh, the family, community, health care system. And the uh, free universal health care system existing alongside a private health care system for those who, who prefer that but a truly public, uh, public system. And Nicaragua has capitalized poor people in programs like uh, Zero Hunger and, and, and Zero Usury 
in a highly effective manner, and we should have taken a lot of people out of uh, out of poverty in uh, schemes that are much better than those proposed by the international organizations who are trying to sell Nicaragua these uh, uh, measures, these conditional grants, to give a conditional grant to a family, to give them money so that their kid would go to school or go to the health center to have a checkup. Nicaragua doesn't do that. Nicaragua didn't accept that. Nicaraguan parents send their kids to school but that's what you should do. Nicaraguan parents have the consciousness of taking their kids to the health center and getting vaccinated without anyone paying them to do it. What happens in Nicaragua is that a poor rural family has received a cow, a pregnant sow, a pregnant cow, a pregnant sow, chickens who don't have to be pregnant because they take care of it themselves. And it also has uh, seed, fertilizer, corral material, and you turn uh, the woman of the household into a second producer in the family. And you improve nutrition through the animal protein that, that the family all of a sudden has. The family income is improved because they're excellent, they take it to market and they, and they sell it. In the, in the urban area, you have a Sotocero, which is the, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the credit scheme, the micro credit scheme out of Bangladesh and the rest of the world that everyone knows. And uh, this one is different. It's called your Sotocero. The micro credit organizations in, uh, in the world and in Nicaragua charge 30, 40 percent a year. For their loans, which is the problem that model has everywhere. It's had that problem in Bangladesh and India too, of uh, high interest rates. In Nicaragua, it's five percent per annum. So it's not the uh, microcredit organization NGO that's uh, gaining the uh, accumulation of capital. It's the small merchant, the small artisan, and some of them have their fourth and fifth loans as they're capitalizing themselves. So this is policies of redistribution in terms of universal free health and education among other programs, and then of capitalizing the poor through Isura Cero, Ambri Cero, and improving uh, roads, highways, electricity, water, sanitation, that improve the quality of life of the poor also. And do you think it's fair to say, Dr. Rakis, that um, Nicaragua, apart from being a model uh, in, in, in its health programs, um, to some extent too in, in its education programs, in my opinion, but uh, I more, agree, I agree. More, more, more especially uh, uh, in its climate change, the, the, the way it's changing its energy matrix, but also in its uh, food self-sufficiency, its food sovereignty. Do you think it's true to say that all those things make Nicaragua a very special country, and for, for that reason, for example, it, uh, it, it, it is treated with respect by much larger countries like, for example, the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China. This is what explains Nicaragua's COVID-19 policy as well. Forty percent of the population lives and works in the countryside. Forty percent. These people cannot be confined. They have lots of things to do every day with the cow, with the chickens, with the fields, especially in April and May, which is the planting season. And so it would be ridiculous to, to have a, a confinement of these people. They have to get out and earn their subsistence and earn a, a subsistence or semi-subsistence economy. Then we have the urban informal sector, which is the majority of the informal sector, of the workers rather, are informal sector. And if they don't earn their livelihood every day, they don't eat. Their family doesn't eat. So that uh, is where the poor people are too, in the countryside and in the informal sector. 
So this is this policy has been protecting the interests of the of the poor people. The same with the public schools remaining open. The private schools, the kids can have uh, internet classes because these are middle class families with uh, with computers. And the kids have tablets. They have uh, 4G uh, cell phones. The poor urban people and the poor rural people, the kids would be left out if you try to tell them that they're going to have uh, internet education. So once again, the policy has been to to defend the poor while promoting strict social distancing, while promoting masks ever more so, as you hear, through the media and through the recommendations to each one to take care of themselves. So shifting back to the, the broader the broader, the broader global context. Um, you say at one point in Equilibria that it's easier for us to continue transforming nature than to transform ourselves. And that makes you sound a bit pessimistic. And are you a pessimist about our prospects for planetary survival and what can each of us do as individuals to defend humanity and the natural world? Actually, that statement is a conclusion after seeing that the way humans have developed across the paleological time span, the, the Paleolithic time span, I mean, the Neolithic, and then coming into the uh, Copper Age, the Bronze Age, the Steel Age, civilizations, advancing to scientific and technical revolutions. We have advanced as a species by transforming nature, by learning more about nature and how to transform nature to our ends. So that's what makes it hard for us to stop doing that, to stop continuing to try to transform nature because it's been our success story. It's been our formula for success. And all of a sudden, we need to put on the brake. We need to get smarter and find different ways of, uh, of doing things. That makes it hard. That makes it hard. Because people realize that uh, they're, they're, they're so accustomed to earning their living, transforming nature. And then there's some other of the alienations also that are, are, are really pernicious, like uh, favoring short-term action that damages nature, even when we realize long-term consequences. That's happening. People know it's going to hurt nature, know it's going to hurt humanity, but they continue doing it. So there's lots of things to overcome. There's lots of things to overcome. And there's that capitalist mindset, there's the hegemonic political, economic, and social system that reinforce capitalism. So the battle is tough. But where is the hope? The hope is in the movements. The hope is in the people obliging the politicians to take action. And that's what happened in the anti-slavery, that's what happened in the anti-colonialism. The politicians moved in the end, in the, in the governments, but they were obliged by the people to do so. And I think that has to happen again. I hope that the, the, in the generational change will push this over. And all of those movements, the extinction movement, the environmental movements, all of those are important in putting together a survival movement, a movement in which we recognize that we are not eternal, that we are not immortal, that we can become extinct. And things that we are doing now increase the probability of our becoming extinct and reduce the probability that life will, uh, will prevail. Why? Because we are damaging the ecosystems the ecosystems
from which life sprang and which have maintained life on planet Earth. We can do that in a slow onset way, like increasing the world's temperature until it reaches 50 degrees and we can no longer exist. Or we can do it fast and dirty with a nuclear exchange that makes human life as we know it um, impossible and provokes a, a nuclear winter of, of 10 years of no sunshine because there's so much dust in the air for so long after and, and radiative dust, radioactive dust on top of that. So there are huge risks, but uh, we need to organize, we need to be proactive and put together this, uh, this arrival movement which Equilibra poses as the, uh, as the solution. Something that struck me very much about the book is that it's very innovative in its presentation. It presents its argument and asks for feedback. Is, am I right in that? Yeah. Could you talk a bit about that? Okay. Equilibra is designed to be an interactive, living book. So, um, on the, on the Equilibra website, there's replacement one at equilibra.org and replacement two at equilibra.org, which refer to the two volumes of Equilibra. The, each theme is organized in ten statements of three or four lines each, and each of those is numbered to make it easy to say, with regard to 363, this data is wrong, please change this data. It should be such and such. Or, with regard to, to 450 to 455, this analysis is weak and uh, should be changed for such and such. I am organizing and an Equilibra panel that will receive these proposals for changes and those that approve will go on to a, uh, on, a on, on website real-time version of Equilibria that's updated as the changes are approved and a footnote credit will be given to those who sent in the, the the changes. And um, that way the book can be continually changing, transforming, as new things pop up they can be included uh, through this uh, I concept of the, of the living book. And so it's, so one of the reasons why it's the first book written in tweets that are numbered is so that this can be manageable, that you can cut this one tweet out and say this should be changed to such and such, and then it can be considered. What the reason for the panel is to avoid the flaw in uh, in Wikipedia. That if you just put in anything anyone sends in, you can start to uh, fill up with some garbage too, as well as uh, good insights and wisdom. So we do want to control it, but we want for it to happen. Thank <laughs> you.